start with some basics, so that we're all feeling like we're, we know what I'm going on about. First off, what is accessibility? So accessibility is the degree to which an environment is usable by as many people as possible, which therefore means that web accessibility is the degree to which a website is usable by as many people as possible. And I don't want to ignore people's needs by being vague about it. Because I think that this can be a bit of a worry when we're trying to sell accessibility and we start talking about the benefits of inclusivity and things like that. We actually end up leaving people out by accident. Honestly, specifically, when we are talking about web accessibility, we are talking about making a website usable by many disabled people. So while being inclusive will allow all the people access to using our sites, many disabled people won't be able to use them at all if we don't do the work to include them. And by that I mean by disabled people, I mean people whose impairments can affect the use of the web. So now we have kind of some vague idea about what I mean by accessibility. I'm going to do a kind of a hand wavy exercise. So first of all, raise your hand or gesture or smile or give me a knowing wink if you feel like you're an expert in accessibility. Cool. Now do the same for if you feel like you have an intermediate level in accessibility. Any full stackers here? I believe in full stack as much as I believe in unicorns. Or, <laughs> or the ability to change Facebook and Google from the inside. So how many of you here feel like you know what you consider to be the basics of accessibility? Cool. And how many people here are beginners, newbies? No shame in it. And have I told you about a book I've written? <laughs> so a lot of people keep telling me that they know the basics about accessibility. I get a lot of people coming to me going, can you give me some more intermediate like, knowledge about accessibility so I can take that away? I know the basics. I know it all already. And as we know from Bruce's talk this morning, WebAIM did an automated accessibility analysis of the top one million home pages. All of these links, by the way, will be on my slide deck on notice later, so you don't need to worry about saving them. And it showed that 97% of these home pages have basic web content accessibility guidelines, what we know as WCAG or WCAG errors that, in my opinion, have fairly straightforward fixes. And so I'll return to these errors a bit later. A quick deviation to anyone who doesn't know what the web accessibility, web content accessibility guidelines, oh, I hate acronyms. They're a standards recommendation. And they help developers and browser makers with guidelines on how to make websites more accessible to disabled people. And they're a really good starting point for learning more about accessibility and how to make sites work for particular needs. And also, you can run automated tests against these specific guidelines. However, they are not a replacement for testing by real humans who have all different ways of using things that we cannot anticipate in some guidelines. And we have a problem in this industry. We have many problems in this industry. But one that I want to talk about today is that we always want to be able to say that we're the best. And let's face it, this country may be sick of experts, but the tech industry is absolutely full of them. <laughs> and it reminds me of this tweet that I saw this week that just, I think, sums up the point really well. There's a reason there isn't a lot of beginner content out there, because everyone is trying to be impressive rather than helpful. And the thing is, the desire to be seen as the best is kind of incompatible with improving. 
Because we can't learn from our mistakes if we believe that we're the best at everything already. And there is no shortcut to being an expert. You can do a boot camp, you can be the first to define a particular term, but you only really know your stuff when you put the work in, when you do it day in and day out, when you find workable solutions to your particular problems that you have. Because we all have unique problems with the projects that we're working on, or with the companies that we're working for, or with our bosses and their arbitrary demands. And we're getting really used to just grabbing a framework that will make everything quicker to build, or even just finding the Stack Overflow article that tells you exactly how to do this one particular thing. And as Andy mentioned earlier, I think when we center ourselves in the development process as designers and developers, and the problem is when we center ourselves, we sacrifice others. We end up having quite shallow skill sets too. And why bother prioritizing being seen to know something when we could actually do the work and actually know about it? So we need to get over ourselves and we need to be able to better serve other people and to do that we have to get over ourselves. And I very much include myself in that. The ego is a difficult thing. So working my way back to the web aim of one million pages. So the failure rate based on automatically detectable errors, 98%. That's the most recent version that they've run this August. And this is what you saw Bruce show you earlier, just in different colors. The top accessibility errors found, low contrast text, around 86%, missing alternative text, 67.9%, empty links, 58.9%, Missing form labels, 52.2%. Missing document language, 30.5%. And empty buttons, 27%. Now, if all of this seems to you to be just, oh, I don't know what any of that is, I've got you. I'm going to go into it now. So what are the straightforward slash easy, as I'm so cockily saying, fixes for these big problems? So I think a lot of you do know the basics. I'm going to run through this reasonably quickly, but there are links on all of it, so hopefully you'll be able to work it out later if you're struggling with this stuff. So low contrast text. This is low contrast text. So it's text that has a low contrast against its background color, which makes it hard to read, especially by people who have sight loss or difficulty reading, or are colorblind, but also for people that are using older devices that have darker screens, that have turned the brightness down on their screen to conserve battery, which is something that I do all the time. And also this, the tiny gray text that Bruce mentioned earlier, which I think is a habit we have as designers of trying to make things small and neat and tidy in our layouts and minimal. And this is Apple's site. And every single time I do a talk, I can go back to Apple's footer and know that I will always find tiny gray text there. <laughs> it's, the thing is, you act like this isn't important information. I think a privacy policy, particularly in this day and age, very important information. We shouldn't be hiding that behind tiny gray text. So I think that that is a, I don't, I think one of the biggest issues with contrast is most people don't know about it. I think that is genuinely one issue where a lot of designers and developers don't know about it and aren't sure how to fix it. But it is one of the easiest things we can fix. And we can do it by starting out with accessible color palettes. And there's a really great article by Stephanie Walter where she's given tips and tricks and tools and things like that that you can use to do it. You can make it much higher contrast, but having good taste in your color picking is down to you. Missing alternative text for images. And I think this is the first thing that most people learn in accessibility. So if I have a cute image like this, I want to be able to give it a text equivalent. And so for this cute photo of my Oscar, I might say, my Huskamoot dog sits on the kitchen floor looking adoringly up into the camera. But often people don't realize that you also need to provide the alternative text attribute 
if your image is decorative. So people will sling images on and think, we don't need it because the image is decorative. But actually, you just want to have an empty attribute like that. And that will tell any assistive technology or anything else that's browsing your page programmatically to ignore that image. And I think whether or not you would put this image on your page is uh, <laughs> up to you. But I don't think that a picture of two men high-fiving is particularly valuable to any page content. <laughs> I think one of the problems why we don't have alternative text everywhere is because we are not providing the means to add it in the authoring tools that we make. And so when we have things like social media, we need to be able to give people the means to add it themselves. And we have to make it clear and visible. And so this is Mastodon, which is a Twitter alternative. And this isn't the best example, but I think it's the, still one of the best I've found. Where now, it's a bad example because the photos meant the text is barely readable, but it does actually say describe for the visually impaired on that image when you upload it. One of the things I think is key about this is it is actually providing instruction to do so, which acts as a reminder to do so, and it is also telling you right away. You don't have to enable it in a setting somewhere under an accessibility setting. You, it's not hidden away in an edit menu somewhere. It's there. It reminds people to do it. And the thing is, a lot of people care. If you tell people this is something that could be helpful, people will do it. <coughs> Empty links. So these are links that have no text inside them. And they're often used for things like clickable areas, and specifically clickable images. So I think this is quite related to alternative text. So this is an image I found where there's text inside an image, and people do still do that, apparently. And this image needs alternative text so that the people that are using assistive technology can actually read what that image says. And so it is just a case of doing this. So while you might be tempted to just wrap the image in a, an anchor, in a link, and they're done, you can click it, you can go to a page, if you just add alternative text to that image, then people will be able to hear what you're saying. Empty buttons, which I think, again, is related to the previous one. So empty buttons are quite similar to empty links. And we see this kind of thing a lot, particularly if you're using icon fonts and things like that, where we have a, a nice image, an icon, in our button that shows us a thing. And your HTML might look something like this. I mean, that's fine and everything, but assisted technology doesn't know what that button does. So we could have the option of adding a title to that button saying next page. And you can hide that text if you must or whatever. Like, it's, it's there. However, galaxy brain option, the best ideal option, is to actually put the text in the button as well, because that helps everyone. Everyone then understands, oh, that arrow going that direction means the next page. It doesn't mean the previous page. Also, makes a lovely, nice hit area. So it's more space for people to be able to hit if they have difficulty with sort of fine motor control or just using a tiny little screen with a touch screen. Missing form input labels is another similarity. So we, know, we all know this is a form input, the humble text box. And we know that we need a label so that people actually know what to put in that text box. And so we often do that. And we do a pretty good job of making it visual in, in most forms. But we have to uh, take into account that we need to make it clear in the HTML as well. And this is something that Bruce touched on earlier. We're going to make it easier for people who can't make that visual connection between the text. And so we can link those form inputs um, to, to their labels using the for attribute. But I had a hunt around because I was like, really, like, why are people not using form labels very much? And I realized what I think the culprit is. It's the humble search input. Because nobody puts a visual like, label on that. No one puts a visible label on it. And so honestly, 
it's, it's, I'd say understandable, understandable but not excusable that they don't put a hidden ver like, label on it. And so I love DuckDuckGo. They are fantastic. It is a very good search engine. Um, but there is no label in the HTML here. Because it's fine, because everyone knows that when you go to a box with a magnifying glass next to it, that that's search. I think our obsession with tine, tidy and minimal interfaces is going a bit too far in this case. It doesn't really matter where you put that label. Just put it somewhere, and then make sure it's also connected in the HTML. So missing document language. So luckily, Sally talked about this really well earlier, so I don't need to go into it in too much depth. But if you just put this little fellow in the top of your HTML, you're pretty much sorted. And if it's not English, you can use the tag for any other language as well. I think a lot of us English speakers are prone to forgetting that English is not the default language. Um, and one of the ways that this actually helps assistive technology as well is with things like pronunciation when reading the content aloud. Because the pronunciation or the meaning of a word can change quite significantly depending on a language. So you might be saying, attention, pay attention in English. Or you might be saying, attention in French. Not a great French speaker. <laughs> So given that so many people keep telling me that they know the basics, how come we do keep seeing so many of these issues? I suspect it's usually because we don't know how to address these particular issues. And I suspect partly it's what I was mentioning earlier about us sacrificing other people's experiences because of our developer experiences. But returning to the WebAIM 1 million, they actually looked into some other interesting things, like the impact of certain frameworks on accessibility. For example, Bootstrap. So homepages in the sample that utilize the popular Bootstrap framework had 1.3 million more accessibility errors than pages that did not utilize Bootstrap. Now, there is a caveat here that we can't know from these data if Bootstrap introduced these errors specifically, but there is a strong correspondence of increased errors when Bootstrap is present. And the similar thing applies to JavaScript frameworks. React, Angular, Vue.js, all correlating to an increase in accessibility errors on a page. And Advertising networks and other third-party technologies, they also impact on accessibility. Home pages that utilize the very common Google AdSense system had 47.2 more errors on average, nearly double than other pages. And pages with reCAPTCHA had 14.9 more errors on average than those without. Pages with Google Maps averaged 13.9 more errors. Unfortunately, they didn't look specifically into AMP or AMP. Fortunately, Adrian Roselli did, though, and he has a really good overview of Google's AMP HTML, and he frequently updates the blog post. I love it when people write like that including this particular update from the 12th of May, which points out that even in four years, with the abundance of resources that Google has, the accessibility is still left wanting. And a lot of that revolves around the use of non-standard HTML elements. Arguably, they're not HTML elements. And they don't utilize all of that accessibility goodness that Bruce was talking about earlier. So I think, I'm not saying get rid of all frameworks, but be framework skeptic, at least. I mean, sure, do use a framework, but do so with caveats. Consider how it might impact the accessibility. Consider what needs to be done to make your code or your design more accessible, and how long that will take, because it will take time. And will it take longer than writing everything from scratch in the first place? And we mustn't forget to consider the impact of using third-party tools at all. And I will come back to that later. 
I think we're entering an era where we can distinguish our products, our services, and ourselves based on the fact that we actually care about each other. The problem is that the tech industry builds things for people like us. People that are not necessarily the most diverse range of people. And it's always easier to create products for people who have the same needs as us. We understand our own requirements better than anybody else. And we understand the reasons behind them better than anybody else. But a lot of successful products are created when people are scratching their own itch. They're trying to solve a problem that they have. However, we are largely people of similar ages and abilities and backgrounds and educational and financial statuses. We end up creating products for people just like us, whatever our backgrounds are, forgetting that many people have requirements that are different from our own, or even requirements that conflict with our own. And so to create more usable and useful products, we need to understand and care about those differing needs. And we hear a lot about this when people talk about empathy, the ability to share the feelings of others. And it's what makes us OK at creating products for other people, because we can try to understand their problems and create solutions that fit their needs. So of course, empathy is much easier to build when you work in a diverse team. And diversity comes from that range of ages, abilities, ethnicities, socioeconomic classes, personal backgrounds, genders, education levels, and so many more characteristics which give us each that unique experience of the world. And so spending meaningful time with people whose experiences differ from our own will help us develop a greater understanding of each other's needs. And the greater capacity a team has for understanding their audience, the more likely they are to solve that audience's problems. And I'll come back to that later. The thing is, having a diverse team can also prevent us from othering our audience. I, have you ever heard people say, stupid users? Or refer to their clients as stupid? And it's very easy to be dismissive of people using our products if we're thinking about them in like an us versus them terms. And it's particularly important not to do this when we're talking about diversity and accessibility. We need to build meaningful products that serve people's needs and value their time. So I'm sure you've heard that accessibility wins are usability wins. And it's totally true. I totally agree with that, but it is also a sales tactic. It's because I'm trying to sell accessibility to you, because I don't actually think that you think it's worth bothering making a website work for disabled people. I like to think of that phrase, carrot or stick, when we're talking about how to sell accessibility to people. So you might have a carrot if you're trying to drive a donkey somewhere and you dangle that carrot in front of them and you say to this donkey, oh, if we finish this trip, you'll get this carrot. Or you have a stick and you say to the donkey, you go on the trip or I beat you with the stick. It's not very nice, um, but this is a fairly common phrase. And so we have different common tactics for selling accessibility. Make your site accessible or someone will sue you. That's a stick. Make your site accessible and you'll get a bigger audience. That's a carrot. Make your site accessible or you'll get bad publicity. And that's another stick. Make your site accessible because usability benefits everyone. Carrot. It's all very well talking about the usability wins of making your site more accessible, but let's not forget that talking about many people here is not the case of whether something is more delightful or convenient an experience. It's the difference between someone actually having access to a thing, something working, or it not working at all, and then not having access, and then being shut out completely. 
is more than irritating. It's the kind of thing that can really impact someone's life severely, it can be the difference between them being able to access a service or not. And 21% of people living in the UK have a disability. This is a self-identified statistic where a person is considered to have a disability if they have a long-standing illness, disability or impairment which causes substantial difficulty with day-to-day -day activities. I mean, 21% is a lot of people to shut out. And it's not only that, but many people with disabilities have more than one type of impairment. And impairments intersect with other parts of our lives too. So these are the impairments reported by disabled people in the UK in 2017 to 2018. The totals will be above 100% because obviously a lot of people can have more than one impairment. And these impairments intersect, creating new needs. And those impairments intersect with our personal needs as well. So our accessibility needs are also impacted by things like our race, our gender, our wealth, our cultures, our socioeconomic classes, our education, and our upbringing. And some impairments are temporary. You might break your arm. They might come and go. They might be a seasonal disorder. So you may not have an impairment now, but there is a 99.99% chance that you'll have an impairment in the future. Not least because every one of us is aging. And how does that affect our use of the web? Well, our eyesight deteriorates, our hearing deteriorates, our fine motor control is affected by aging joints and muscles. We may even get arthritis. Our memory is affected and dementia becomes more common as we age. And so what happens when we don't design for people who have impairments, including those brought about by aging? Well, we sabotage our future selves. And we need to think in the long term about what we're building. We must equip ourselves to design for a diverse audience with a wide range of needs. We need to research and to educate ourselves and to talk to people that have needs that differ from our own. Oh, jumped ahead. We need to hire diverse teams. But as Nat Dudley said in a brilliant talk last year, Hiring a diverse team is not enough if you do not listen to them. We don't just hire diverse teams so we don't get shamed for our very white male company photos. We also need to diversify our source material, the books we read, the people we follow on social media. If all of those people that are providing the stuff that we read are from the same background or similar backgrounds to us, they're all going to be saying the same stuff anyway. And so it's easy to think, well, I've done all this stuff, and so I'm good to go, that I'm ready. I'm equipped to design for other people. We have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap that many designers fall into of being colonial, assuming that we know what's best for people, the people that are using what we build, when we come from different backgrounds and we have different needs. And that's what's built the technology of the world today, designed for and used by wealthy people who look the same, come from very similar backgrounds, deciding what is good for us. And these six men in the top 13 richest people in the world. So what motivates them to build technology for us? Money, which they get from investors who want them to grow, so they get more money. Systemic inequality is higher than it has ever been. The world's eight richest people have the same wealth as the poorest 50%. Not only will these things not solve systemic inequality, they are actively contributing to make it worse. And that's why mainstream technology today is not inclusive, because of these factors because of the factors where technology doesn't recognize our needs. Their technology is frequently harmful to us. Their technology excludes us. 
We look at this example from Facebook, who allow you to decide what your own gender is and define it yourself, but not when you sign up. Because when you sign up, it is easier to put you in a box, because that makes it easier to target you and to profile you. This is an example of the information that data brokers collect from various websites, things that they've obtained that crack labs looked into. And this is very, very tiny, tiny text, so I'll point it out up here. But they have things like whether they think you're disabled. Think, they don't know. What you've searched for. Oh, have you searched for abortion or legalizing drugs or gay marriage? Have you searched for protests and riots and boycotts and information like that? Boris Johnson wants to use gov.uk platform to profile and target its citizens. Do you think that's a wise idea? Their technology enables harassment. There's a reason why filling out the Twitter form for saying that there's a problem when you're reporting someone does little to nothing. Because abusive engagement is more valuable than no engagement to them. Their technology stops us from getting insurance and loans based on the information that the data brokers have on us. Their technology passes our information on to authoritarian governments. Because they did already build the database of Muslim people. It's called Facebook. And their technology always comes with strings attached. Facebook offered free internet to people in India. Free internet that happened to be restricted to accessing Facebook and accessing websites through Facebook. And how much do the people building this technology actually care about these things? I mean, it's fine for them, isn't it? I mean, the Facebook board member, Mark Anderson, said, anti-colonialism has been economically catastrophic for the Indian people for decades. Why stop now? And when people questioned whether Google should be collecting all of this information about us all the time, Eric Schmidt said, if you have something you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. The thing is, marginalized groups, including disabled people, are far more vulnerable to unethical technology like this. And the lives of marginalized people are most at risk. Disabled people are already discriminated against. We shouldn't be actively making it worse. And marginalized people don't always have the time and the resources to seek out alternatives. So we can't separate inclusive design from ethical practice. We don't just want to open up harmful technologies to everyone. And the more we actually build on ethical technology, the harder we actually make it to build ethical technology, the harder it is to finance it, to find the right tools, to find the people who want to work on the alternatives. And so again, we continue to sabotage our future selves. And as a very wise man in this room once tweeted, I think, not everything should be accessible. Some things shouldn't exist at all. Because the thing is, we build the new everyday things, the people working in technology, and we have to take responsibility for that. Technology has to be more. Our lives and our families and our communities and our societies need us to build technology for more than just making money for rich people. So what's the carrot for building beneficial everyday things? Will we be rewarded with a better society for doing this kind of work? And what's the punishment for building harmful things? Is it bad publicity or damaged reputations or being sued? I mean, all of these are sticks that might hurt us as individuals, but are we really going to be punished for harming other people? So a lot of people say to me, well, where do you draw the line? There's nuance here. I have a suggestion. Could the technology harm me? Could the technology harm other people? There's the line. And you might feel as though 
You're just one tiny bit of this much bigger machine that is the tech industry. No one take photos of me in front of this slide. <laughs> we are an industry made up of many persons. And if more of us made an effort, we could have a huge impact. We have to remember that we are more than just the company that we work for. If you work for a big corporation that does unethical things, yet yeah, you probably didn't make the decision to do that bad thing. But I think the time has come that we can no longer unquestioningly defend our employers. We need to use our social capital. We need to be the change we want to see. So what is that change? How can we be that change? I have a few suggestions. Be independent. We've got to be comfortable being different. We can't just follow other people's leads when those other people aren't being good leaders. Don't look to heroes who can let you down. Don't be loyal to big corporations who don't care anything for you. Be the advisor. Do the research on accessibility and on inclusivity and on ethical technology. Make recommendations to other people. Make it harder for them to make excuses about not doing it. Be the advocate. Marginalised people shouldn't have to risk themselves to make the change. Advocate for others. Advocate for the underrepresented. And be the questioner. Question those defaults. Try asking a why a fr what a framework's impact is on the accessibility of your page. Ask why was it be chosen to be built that way in the first place. Try asking a startup how it makes its money. Be the gatekeeper. When the advocacy isn't getting you far enough, use your expertise to prevent unethical things from happening on your watch. You don't have to deploy a website. And other people might not know how to deploy that website. Be difficult. Be the person who is known for always bringing up that same issue again. Embrace the awkwardness that comes with that, because that is power. Call out questionable behavior. And don't let anybody tell you that you're going to get more stuff done if you're more professional or if you smile more. Don't let people tell you to be quiet. Be the supporter. If you're not comfortable speaking up for yourself or speaking up at all, at least be there for those who do. Remember that silence is complicity. And speaking up is risky. We're fighting entities far bigger than ourselves. We have our lives, the way we make money, at risk. But we can't let technology continue in this way. In the end, I'm not here to drive you. I don't have any power over you. I don't want to have any power over you. I don't have a gift for you for doing the right thing. I'm not going to tell you that you're wonderful. But you do have that power for yourself. You can build yourself a stick. You can continue to punish yourself with it until the end of time. Or you can grow yourself a carrot. As someone said to me after I gave a talk a few weeks ago, I'm the woman who comes and tells people to eat their vegetables. <laughs> I mean, as far as we're finding that a little bit sexist, it's not true. That's not what I'm doing. I'm here because I want to tell you that you deserve better. Thank you. <laughs>